Cookies. Hi, welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Hello, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Maddie Watt. I work at The Hive and The Hive Think Tank, and we are so excited to bring you today's event, FinTech and Emerging Markets. All right, awesome. If you guys just want to go ahead and drop your location, I'd love to hear where you guys are joining us from today. We're going to give it just 10 more seconds for the room to kind of fill up before we jump into uh, the ground rules for today's webinar and then just briefly kind of go over what you guys can expect to see. All right, awesome. Welcome all of our new friends. Where is everyone joining from? Great. So let's jump into it, okay? Awesome. Thank you, Robbie. If you could just put the slides up for me. Welcome, everyone. Today we have an amazing conversation about fintech and emerging markets. But for those of you who don't know, this is an event by the Hive Think Tank. So what is the Hive Think Tank? We are an ecosystem of entrepreneurs, corporations, and thought leaders, and we are focusing on all things a la AI, data, technology, and innovation. We are hosting conversations about every other week or so. Sometimes we double up and do two in a week. Um, and we're also publishing blog pieces on all of our thoughts on these different technologies and integrations. So I will drop the links for our meetup page and our uh, Medium site. Those are the best way to stay up to date on all the things that we are doing. And I just wanna give a quick thank you to our sponsors. Next page, thank you, Ravi. Avanta, Gamuda, SAP, Tibco. If you wanna find out more about sponsoring the Hive Think Tank, uh, just go ahead and give me an email. I will drop you the email in the chat. And then I wanna briefly go over the events that we've got coming up and I will send you guys the links for those so you can register today. And then I'm gonna just tell you real quick the ground rules before we jump right in. So Ravi, do you mind? Thank you so much. So next Wednesday, we have an amazing, amazing conversation on designing the next generation of data systems for real-time analytics. This is going to be with Druba, who is the CTO and co-founder of Rockset. He was also one of the original uh, founder co-founders of Hadoop, as well as some other really key, amazing um, technology pieces. So definitely join for that next Wednesday. Ravi, thank you. And then this is not published yet, but this is going to be really interesting. We're going to do a 90-minute session on insurance for the sharing economy. So we're going to do a dual panel system. This is going to be a new uh, format for us. We're really excited to test it out. So I will also drop the link for that. And that will be on Wednesday, December 1st. And, and this we are doing in collaboration with Avanta Ventures, which is the uh, CVC corporate venture arm of, of CSA, the insurance company. And it's not published yet, but I will share it with you guys as soon as we can. <laughs> and then we're super excited to do um, an amazing event on sustainability and how leading brands such as Nespresso and HP Inc. are really reinventing the way they interact with their uh, customers and taking sustainability at the forefront of their, their product and their product visions. So definitely sign up for this one. This will be on Thursday, December 9th. We are going to be joined by the CEO of Nespresso, the global head and general manager of HP Supply as well as a senior partner from Kearney. So this is an amazing event that you will want to join. And finally, is the future of cities underground? This is going to focus on tunneling and underground cities um, as we continue to grow as a global uh, entity and prize, we have to start looking at different ways to work in our system when so limited uh, resources and space. So going underground, definitely join for that on Tuesday, December 14th with our partners, Gamuda. Uh, so real quick, guys, I'm going to let Ravi, TM Ravi, he is the uh, founder and managing director of The Hive, go in and talk to you about The Hive. But before I let him take over, please go ahead and ask questions using the Q&A button. The button is located at the bottom of your screen. This makes it really easy for our moderator, Eduardo, to go ahead and click through your questions and make sure they get answered. And lastly, this session is going to be recorded and automatically emailed out to you guys tomorrow. So if you have to drop off early or your friend or colleague couldn't make it, don't worry, you can share it later. Thank you guys and enjoy today's session. Thank, thank you, Matty. So, so very briefly, the Hive is a venture studio. It's a subclass of venture capital. Um, the Hive here is, is focused on leveraging deep tech data AI to drive transformation, growth, sustainability. And you'll see sort of our focus areas, 
you know, around supply chain and fulfillment, around uh, risks, especially digital risks, security, cybersecurity, privacy, the broad transformation of the industrial segment, um, uh, a lot of things related to kind of edge, and finally sort of around health and, and life sciences. Um, we are based here in Palo Alto. If you're an early stage entrepreneur, we'd love to hear from you. And, and in addition to our presence in, in Palo Alto, uh, we have uh, the Hive Brazil led by Everson Lopez, the Hive in India. And last year, we started the Hive in Southeast Asia based in, in Malaysia. I'm incredibly excited today to, to be introducing the, the panel today. So we have Eduardo Rossman, who is, who is the head of uh, uh, equity research at BTG Pactual from, from Brazil, from Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, we also have our colleagues, um, uh, Sumant Mandal, who is, who is also founder of The Hive and uh, managing director and co-founder of March Capital uh, from Santa Monica. Sumant recently had a pretty big exit in a, in a company called Buildesk based in, in India. And perhaps he'll, he'll talk more about that. And, and finally, my colleague, Everson Lopez, who's managing uh, partner and co-founder of The Hive Brazil. And, and so uh, uh, Everson and The Hive Brazil have a number of high profile companies in FinTech, CloudWalk, um, one of the leading payments company, uh, Smart Bank, and, and, and so on. With that, let me hand it over to Eduardo to, to, to drive the conversation. We will take questions. So please kind of drop your questions in the Q&A button and Eduardo will, will, will find the time to, to throw the question to the audience. Thank you guys. Oh, great. Hello. Hello, everyone. So very happy to, to be here. Everson is a good friend and he invited me, so I'm happy to help. Uh, uh, just, a, let's say, just a very brief introduction here. So I've been, I've, been, I've been covering the financial sector here at BTG Pactual, naturally more focused on public equities, right? But, uh, but naturally studying a lot about what's going on in the private markets as well. So I really like to discuss, you know, uh, let's say the market with, with Everson, you know, we do that from time to time. And I think that the idea here is to, is to talk about both things, right? What's happening in the private markets, what's happening in the fintech world. And I think I, I can probably help more uh, with regards public markets, right? Now we do have a new bank, you know, trying to IPO. We have an, a more and more companies, you know, going into US looking for you know more investors you know looking for better valuations looking for investors that understands that business model right so so uh, happy to discuss that so everson not sure if you want to maybe uh, start you know uh, with your what 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 would be interesting do you think uh, to discuss here in this in this panel sure so first of all you know uh, thanks dudu uh, to join us i'm really glad that we are here with our colleague Sumant as well. Sumant is a really good friend, one of the you know most incredible VC and and and, and that I know. He's also has a great uh, coverage doing fast in fintechs for quite a long time. You know, actually one of his former companies was, of, was a, one of the first backers of PayPal after Bubble, and 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 also Sumant's been very active in, in fintech space generally in US and India. And um, particularly, I'm involved in the market here in Brazil for quite a long time and 15 years on, on the VC industry, seeing the whole evolution of the fintech revolution that we're seeing right now that started with payments, the broken of dual poly and payments back in 2005 by Central Bank. And, and as we all talking all the time, you know, we are seeing that uh, this division between public and private markets is now more a question of a maturity of the companies because what is happening, the trends, the transformation, you know, uh, the drivers that are pushing the innovations, the market is kind of uh, uh, in, impacting the, you know, uh, 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 the, the generation of these companies that are coming to the market and it's, it's just a question of time when they get to maturity to go to the public markets, but the trend is also impacted, you know, uh, uh, the industry overall. It doesn't matter if you're private or public, the trend behind is the same and it's a very powerful trend. So the idea here, to, here today is like, how do we, 
have this conversation more broadly, you know, from uh, opportunities and what we're seeing in the transformation of these three different markets, like Brazil, which is a very specific market, India is a very specific market, huge markets, uh, US as well, you know. Um, so, but behind that, we are seeing a very important technology trend, a very important and common uh, human, you know, behavior trend coming by generations and how they're using the services. And the pain points and needs in society that this new generation of companies are solving and they are growing really fast, you know, compounding at incredible rate. And in, as we are seeing to now, reaching the public markets at incredible valuations, creating a gigantic uh, value for society. Um, and uh, and then, you know, of course, feel free to send questions on, over the, over the Q&A and, and we take this as more as a broader conversation. So at my point, I will start here and then someone can, can and put his view as well. Um, Thinking more about the, the you know the fintech theme, you know, and I think the fintech world is becoming a kind of small for the size of the opportunity and the transformation that we're seeing. Um, uh, uh, it's huge, right? Uh, if you look for the financial services industry uh, globally today, you know, is around twenty three trillion dollars. It's a huge industry, one of the oldest industries in the world. That you know what what we saw over the last ten years in terms of transformation and then you know newcomers are just the beginning of the bigger revolution, you know. Uh, we are, the majority of these companies that emerge so far uh, are companies who are innovating the level of uh, application or distribution, you know. But the infrastructure behind is kind of the legacy infrastructure that all these markets operate. In the case of Brazil, is the Brazilian financial system, which is great. Uh, 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 it's a phenomenal job that the central bank did over the last few years, building that infrastructure that's reliable, uh, scalable, and have a big reach in the gigantic country like Brazil, and it's safe, more, most, and, 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 and you know. Um, but, you know, what we're seeing is that uh, these infrastructures, you know, are becoming uh, old, and we are seeing an emergency of new infrastructure that can completely transform uh, the way uh, the, the the financial services and, and the opportunities of the market and to the either merchants or users will relate to financial services and that's a really big important trend uh, that will uh, pretty much uh, impact every type of business payments banking lending insurance um, KYC uh, you name it um, so uh, I'm I'm pr I'm very excited I think we are going to see one of the biggest revolution economically. Uh, and, and one of the biggest industry in the world uh, over the next 10 years. And uh, and I, what I'm seeing in the market is that there's a huge value to be created for investors, entrepreneurs, into society overall uh, as outcome of this trend. And I'm very excited about that. But I would love to, to get your take as well, Suman, and what you're seeing between India and U.S. in terms of this big big technology push on that. Um, it's a lot, lot to... Um understand and swallow because fintech or financial services is almost one out of every four venture dollars goes into something which is fintech related. One thing I'll say before we start, before I start is that, you know, we've convinced Ravi to start taking cryptocurrency as sponsorship. So as, if anybody has any Bitcoin lying over, you should please send it to the hive, they need it. Um, so I think this conversation is very interesting. Everson and I have this conversation often, which we try and compare and contrast what's happening in Brazil especially in financial services, which is a big part of what we do. What's happening here in the US, which is a very different ecosystem from what's happening in either Europe or China or India, which is, you know, each, I would say geography has its own trajectory when it comes to financial services or FinTech. But the broad trend is um, everything is becoming more and more digital. So commerce is becoming more digital. Enterprise communication is becoming more digital. We are all talking to each other on Zoom. So currency has to follow. That's the fiat of exchange, of value. So if you're going to buy something online, you have to pay for it digitally. You can't pay in cash, right? Funny story, I have a 17-year-old daughter who I asked her, do you need money? She said, no, no, I don't need money. I have Apple Pay. So I'm like, that's free. <laughs> <laughs> it's but a pixel. But the mindset of the consumer has changed, right? If you look at the younger generation of people anywhere in the world, the concept of physical currency is is not important. It doesn't exist. It, it first went into plastic and today is going into virtual. And it, essentially what that does is opens up a host of new opportunities. If you look at FinTech infrastructure and Everson, you mentioned that it's really, you know, it's a couple of decades old. Banking systems 
are batch processing non-real-time old systems, but they're trillions of dollars of investments that have gone into them. No one's going to rip them out and replace them with something new. So you have these neo banks starting, trying to compete with new software, new kinds of value add services. But you also have these companies trying to add a layer of intelligence on top of old banking systems. So in some ways, what we're seeing is just this massive wave of innovation trying to catch up to how human behavior is changing. Now, it, you know, you, early on, we saw that behavior change about a decade ago in China because China didn't have any infrastructure. So basically, the messaging platforms became the fintech platforms and you transfer of wealth and, and buying of things became, came on top of these messaging platforms. In India, it was the opposite. India actually, and I'd love to hear how Brazil operated. India, it was more, it was not e-commerce or value change between people. It was driven more by business to business opportunities. It was driven by people wanting to pay their bills online for their electric utility or wanting to pay for taxes online. Or, you know, so consumer sort of digitization wave caught on, I'd say a decade after the business we have caught on. And our company Build as you mentioned ever since we just announced that we are exiting, uh, merging into NASPER's uh, payment company called PayU to become the fifth largest payments company in the world now. It started out by servicing these large businesses, utilities, telecom companies, state governments, government, and consumer came later, right? E-commerce came later. So e-commerce came probably 10 years ago. Today, it's the, maybe the fastest growing part of payments, but Payments came from more, I would say, existing businesses trying to capture, co collect money. Now, um, it's a massive market. I think there's probably five companies that have come out of Brazil as public companies in the payments, in payment space that have been publicly listed here in the US, right? I think same will happen in India. We sold Buildesk, Paytm listed this week for $20 billion, one of the largest IPOs in the history of the country. Uh, we'll see more happen. It's a very exciting part of what we do here in March, what we're doing at Hive, trying to create for these new kind of technologies, bring more and more efficiency into this system. So I'd love to learn how Brazil kind of uh, evolved and, and what you see happening there. And then we can talk a little bit about India, but also mix in something in the US. In some ways, I would call the US more of an emerging FinTech market than- Totally, like, totally agree with that. <laughs> opinion, right? They're ahead of the US in many ways. Totally. Yeah. You know. I, I used to say, and I, and I truly believe that, I think Brazil is the most exciting fintech market in the world by now, for different reasons. Um, first, we have a central bank here who was promoting a big reform of the last 10 years around competition and pretty much regulating, but also enabling new companies to put innovations in the market in a safe way. And we, are, we come from a very centralized market, you know, kind of a four to five big banks controlling the vast majority of the money flow in the country to now we may have hundreds of thousands of companies around payments fintechs generally and they're fully operating integrative central bank in a safe way without putting the risk on the system right so and that's very unique and the central bank team is is, is a very skilled uh people really understand you know very in depth from crypto blockchain uh, UPI, open bank in Europe, how, how that evolved in UK, how that evolved in, in, in Europe, you know, they're pretty on top of what is going on and promoting competition, you know, which I think is phenomenal. The second thing is that, you know, Brazil is very sophisticated uh, for, for the financial side, you know, uh, we have to deal with fraud in a, in a scale and in a, in a, in the size of the threat, like any other countries does have. So we have cheap cards for around, you know, 10 years maybe, and cheap cards that you have to have cheap and pin in US, these are kind of a five to 10 years. Mm, yeah. Years, right? So the, that security issue creates a lot, of, a lot of innovation and a lot of expertise that we don't see in other countries yet. And there's one now that's very hot in US, which is buy now, pay later, yeah. right? And, 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 uh, and we do have that here since the 80s because we have the inflation on the 80s. So people have to pay installments and that become part of the financial with infrastructure. With checks, right? With checks. With checks, paper checks, right? Yeah. So uh, we, we call that in the, in the past, Sumat, as a flying checks, right? <laughs> so <laughs> you put a date, a future date on the check and, and the people will, will, will discount and that becomes the installments that by now is the 50% of the credit card volumes in Brazil, very important for retail, 
if it doesn't have an offer installments, you know, they pretty much cannot sell the same volume that it would sell installments. In fact, one of our portfolio companies, Cloudwalk, truly innovative on that field and makes the companies that can sell installments of 12 times in Brazil and receive the money in D plus one, right? Which is unusual in Brazil. Yeah, okay. uh, D plus 28, right? But anyway, so all that elements, when you combine with, uh, there's an anthropological thing with the country is the, is the second largest market for the, all the big uh, social media groups, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, so the level of adoption for technology, new things are pretty high. And, and what we are seeing now, you know, great companies like Nubank is IPOing, and it's a new brand. This company was started in 2013. And, you know, who would say that older generations would trust their money in a new brand? But the younger generations, I mean, they, they also, don't want to put their money in the old brand. So correct, this is a kind yeah. of interesting thing as well. But also COVID accelerated a lot of this, right? What totally. happens and people didn't have the opportunity or, the, or the, even the choice to do it any other way. They had to do things digitally yeah. and there's no going back. You know, another question I had for you, was, you know, in India, there's one part of fintech, which is payments and infrastructure. The other part of payments, which you mentioned, or fintech is around credit, is access yeah. to capital, right? And especially in India, access to capital was very difficult for anyone who was not in the top 1%, either individuals or corporations, right? Because it was controlled by big banks and you had to have credit ratings, et cetera. And it, a small yeah. business never had access to capital. The only access they had was through friends and family or the local money lender, exorbitant 60, 70% rates, right? Even to buy a car, a used car, less than 5% of used cars in India financed by banks. Wow. So I think there's an opportunity in India. What I've seen evolving is that even though your offering or your technology may be payment rails, the way you make money is on credit. Yeah. Plus or minus. I don't know if it's a good thing or bad thing because credit scares me, right? It's, it's not yeah. technology. It's, it's, really, <laughs> it's risk assessment. Yeah. And in a country where there's lack of real data, you can't process and get risk like a rating that we do here in the US. Again, all coming together, but there's a big challenges to be solved. What do you see happening in Brazil? So that's a great point. U.S. is very easy, right? Everyone is a positive approach for credit bureaus, right? Yeah. Everyone has their own number. You get the number, you have your score, you get your credit pricing. In Brazil, is a negative approach. Everyone's a bad payer until they prove the wrong, yes, right? Absolutely. And uh, and of course, this can be misused, right? In terms of taking opportunities to, to price higher credit uh, 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 to uh, good payers, right? And of course the banks and the lenders will make better margin. So, uh, and that's not in accordance with the risk they're taking. Uh, and ultimately that was the, it's, a, it's a data problem, but the industry uh, it learns and understand how to do credit uh, over that model, which is phenomenal because it's pretty much like how you do it's a kind of, you do a kind of a behavior credit type of approach without it's the data. Driven. Yeah, it's AI driven. It's right? not driven by rules. Not driven by rules or yeah. scores. And Central Bank is doing a terrific uh, approach right now. By the end of this year, you're going to have the Open Bank uh, uh, as, as officially uh, started in Brazil. And what it's doing is that the four big banks, so they, they, they separate banks on, on the balance sheet levels. So the first tier of balance sheet levels, they're going to be obliged to exchange the customer data with the other institution. Interesting. So, so what we are having here so far is that the only asymmetry in the market is the data symmetry. Yeah. Because if you have the 80% of the transaction volumes, you have 80% of the data, so you can price correctly. But what's going to happen is that new companies, of course, re regulated by central bank, they're going to be on this exchange of data. And this data will have to be mutual exchangeable, which means that the data intelligence is going to be spread around the market over the next five, 10 years. Depending so it takes a competitive edge out of it. Yeah, opens it up. The, the marketplace approach, what's going to happen? Who, who is the most intelligent and more efficient with the better value proposition wins, which is phenomenal, yeah. right? And, uh, and, 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 the rule, is, and and the rule, and sorry, the, sorry, yeah, because the, the rule actually is it's quite good for for consumers, right? Because let's say, for the, I think the, the banks and the regulator they were discussing like what do I need to share, right? Uh, uh, do I need to share, let's say, the credit limits that I have with that client or not? 
because the, some of the big banks, they were arguing that, no, this is our data, right? We, and the regulator said, no, no, you have to, you don't, ha you don't need to share how you got there, let's say, uh, but you need to share what the credit limits that this client had with you, you know, for the last five years, you know, so, so you, so, so this is very valuable, right? So, and, and I would flag that, uh, and ever so you can, you can add on that as well, that open banking already started with, with PIX as well, right? Because exactly. PIX, the instant payments, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's basically the central bank, they are the backbone, right? They are, they are the clearinghouse and they are forcing everyone to connect right uh everyone and not just banks like so payment institution wallets etc they're they're all, they are forcing everyone to connect and p2p transfers for free naturally p2m they allow you to charge which is also smart because look they allow you know participants to have some to have some money which is different from in mexico for instance Cody, Cody in mexico which is the instant payment in mexico it, it, it's not working Right. Why? Because banks are the only ones that can join and they can't charge anything. So there's no incentive at all. Incentive. Right. So, so, so you need to have uh, both things as well, right? So you need that regulator probably helping, but allowing participants to at least make some money, right? So, you know, in India, they had UPI, which is the- Yeah, that's what I'm going to question too. How's that? Because, you know, some of the funny story, the central bank in Brazil officially say they got inspiration by the UPI in India. Yeah. After yeah. seeing all of all, a lot of models in the world, and UPI and it started like five years ago, four years ago, few years it's ago. It's taken off like crazy ever since. And and really, as you said, Eduardo, the P two P part of payments is now frictionless. You can transfer money on your wallet to someone else's wallet, no cost. But if you want to pay your bill using your wallet, or you want to buy something on e commerce using wallet, there is a business model attached to it. So what has that done? That has taken people's transaction volume up dramatically. So yes, not all of that volume has a business model attached to it, but if the volume has gone up 10x, you at least see revenues go up 5x, right? And the regulators also have been very kind of, I would say very smart in India in how they have architected this industry. The other thing they've done, which is incredible, which I don't know if any other part of the world has done yet, is have, they passed this thing called GST, which is the global sales tax for the country. Otherwise in India, in every state, you had a different tax and you had to, figure out what you were doing, how goods were transferred over the borders of the states, big mess. So they, but part of that is that every invoice, any business raises has to be raised electronically and has to be paid electronically because they're trying to track revenue, right? They want to make sure that they can tax that revenue. So just imagine how that transforms your supply chain finance. We just invested in a company that we'll announce that basically looks at how a supply chain of a, of, a, of a manufacturer is resilient, how good their customers are, how good their customers' customers so they'll be able to finance them or not. That data never existed. So now you have this vast majority, you know, sort of business sort of opportunity to think about how you can make capital access more efficient. In India, the biggest problem businesses had, consumers had is access to capital. Just couldn't have it. And that is what is being transformed, I think, in the country and will be the opportunity for the next 10 years plus. Not the consumer payments, not the real-time payments. That all has been done. It's happening already. It's how do you, how do you finance business? Yeah. How do you finance someone's home buy? How do you finance someone's car buy? You know, things we take for granted here in the US was not available for people there. Yeah, or if a bill on the road, on the very, a lot of friction, either in terms of experience or pricing, uh, uh, and, 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 and lack of liquidity in secondary markets and things like that that creates the industry more, more fluid. Uh, it's funny you say that, that supply chain because, you know, the way that we look to the, to the finance here in general, I think the, 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 the human beings are, are transactional beings, right? We transact before, before we relate. So before I talk to someone, et cetera, I may be transacting with his company, right? Mm -hmm. And the level of engagement we have to transactions is gigantic. And, uh, and the level of network effect behind money is, is gigantic, right? So you mentioned you, you got a relationship with one company that you get their supply chain with their suppliers, their suppliers. So if you explode in three levels of relationship through money, because money travels, right? The level of data, knowledge, uh, and, 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 uh, and, and the network effect you can have through this digital business that the transaction now is gonna be more digitalized creates a very powerful, sustainable, uh, long-term competitive advantage, right? Yeah. So, 
and and that that I will touch with uh, with the do as well because I'm getting I, I get some questions about people who are not in the market say hey this valuation is crazy, right? Uh, what people are seeing these companies in terms of valuation that you know I cannot relate to the top line revenue or EBITDA, yeah, right? And I'm saying well it's the it's the compound growth of this company everything compounding fifty percent one hundred percent a year ten years yeah huge. Plus the network effect capabilities that come is through that, but I would love your take around that, Dudu, do, because you know uh, uh, you, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a complicated, sure. but that's a very complicated question, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, it is. would go better. Yeah. No, no, I, I would just flag that. Uh, yes, it is very difficult. I think people that say that they know exactly how to value these companies, they're lying because it's very hard. It's a uh, it's a wild animal, right? Uh, uh, the thing is, is that uh, when we think about payment companies, for instance, uh, we do see, let's say dozens, you know, more than 20, 30, very successful companies ac across the globe and doing business and making money in different ways. So I think that the, th the thesis behind payments and how they make money or how they could make more money, I think is already well consolidated, right? I think that, uh, let's say digital banking, is still not very well consolidated yet, right? We don't, we don't, we only have a few kind of a listed digital banks out there. You have like Tinkoff in Russia, you do have Caspi, but they are kind of a hybrid animals, you know, in, in, in countries that, uh, let's say, uh, Russia and, and, and Kazakhstan, maybe they are not the best examples, you know. Uh, uh, you do have the the Asian guys, some of the Chinese guys who are who are who became the super apps, but here in in, in the West, you know most of the digital banks, they're still not profitable or they have very low profitability and they're still not listed, right? So I think that the, yeah, so I think that the, 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 the thesis is being kind of a still consolidated. But look, if you look to, let's say, new bank, you know, the filing, right? The numbers are, are quite, let's say, they are quite strong. I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that they are profitable already in Brazil and, and they are going to become profitable. Naturally, there's this question about, let's say, how profitable they can be. Right. So, but, uh, but, but there are several things that, uh, that let's say in, in this story, uh, particularly impresses me like, uh, 48 million clients, pretty much only in Brazil still, they are just started in Mexico and Colombia, 35 monthly active users. Actually they have, uh, I don't know, almost 20 million like daily active users. Uh, they, they started only with one product. Now they are scaling the other one. So, uh, I think, uh, uh, like clients they love. I, I do have here lots of, let's say, younger analysts here that they love the bank, which is which is odd, right? I love my bank. It's not something very, very common that it, for you to hear, right? But, uh, and naturally, I think that the, the central bank, like Amazon said, the central bank, they are, let's say, uh, they are tackling many issues of Brazil, right? Creating new infrastructure and rails, right? Uh, which I think is very relevant. Like, like PIX opens, a, let's say, a huge opportunity for you to do many different businesses. You're going to have open banking. You mentioned credit. Credit is still the, probably where the, the big banks, they still have, you know, big competitive advantages against most of the new names. Wow, because they have scale to recover the credit, you know, scale to, exactly. <laughs> so, because scale, he, yeah. because he in Brazil, and it's like in India, right? Like in India and many of the other emerging markets, right? The banks that they do a good job is the one that they learned how to operate in this crazy environment, right? The ones that they know the cities and the regions where they can't land, uh, the ones that they they know that, look, if, if I get my car back, you know, how, how to get a car back and sell fast, you know, uh, and, 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 and because of that, the central bank, they are also working on a series of, uh, let's say, rules to, to make, you know, banking collaterals more transparent and easy to, 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 to change hands, right? They have these receivables chamber for credit cards. So there's a lot of things going on. So, uh, uh, so I think it would be also interesting to hear you guys uh, if you could talk about the, the role of the regulator, right? Because I, I look, I think it's a given, right? Technology is here, digitalization will go up. Uh, but uh, if you do have, you know, uh, a, 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 let's say a good regulator, things can happen faster, right? And, and maybe in a, in a better, uh, yeah, a better I mean, way. India, right? I would say the Reserve Bank of India, the RBI of India has been a great regulator. And it's not been always pleasant. Like as a person who is in business, suddenly the rules are changing and you have to conform to new kind of regulations is not always present, but they have done a great job of balancing the risk to a consumer 
with allowing the innovation to, to prosper, right? And so there's a, that's the balance the RBI has to keep, continue to keep playing. Adopting new technologies, opening things up to new, new kinds of products and services, and they make mistakes too, you know, like you have this dual factor authentication for e-commerce, like that just kind of will kill e -com. you know, So there's lots of things that they have to kind of work through. So I think the regulator is an ongoing dialogue, but I will also say that regulation helps the incumbent. So if you look at just historically, the people who have size and scale have always benefited from more regulation, not suffered, right? So it's a balance, and I don't know if that balance anyone has a perfect answer for it, but it is a, it is a balance. Um, the other challenge, and at least emerging, at least in India, and I'd love your take on Brazil, is that the take rates, the amount of money available on a per transaction, is de minimis. It's one tenth of what it is in Europe. So if you can take two percent in Europe for a transaction, it's 02 percent in India. Wow. Volume may be big, scale may be big, but the take rates are very very little. Now, Brazil has a different, Brazil is much higher. It's probably 6% versus 2%. Well, so I'd yeah. like to understand why do you think that is? Like, why is, why is there that inefficiency in Brazil in, in the payments or, or the world of financial services? Well, that, that's, that's a, a great point. I remember talking with the CEO of Buildesk and the um, um, Montgomery Summit a few years ago. We were, we were exchanging notes. And, uh, and he kind of made me repeat three times the take rate, you know, yeah. that our companies have in Brazil, because it's, uh, something is wrong on that. But um, look, uh, the Brazilian, uh, the Brazilian banks in general, they have you have to give their credit to highly invested in infrastructure over the last 20, 30 years. These guys expanded dozens of billions in terminals, uh, ATMs, you know, to make the the, the system uh, infrastructure work and secure, right? And the problem uh, 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 that we got in pricing because they didn't get competition. You know, it's, you know, it's a uh, four banks. Uh, usually, you know, the private banks they have to be better than the public banks, right? As you know, as a government-controlled bank, you know, the level of service is not a kind of a right. It's kind know, of a monopoly. Uh, yeah. yeah, you know, and then they can they have this kind of oligol oligopoly that they have just to be a little bit better than these guys, right? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but. Luckily, that changed, right? And now they they have to be better than the, than the new guys. And the new guys doesn't have infrastructure, doesn't have legacy investments to protect. And as you mentioned, in India, it's very simple. They're built entirely on the cloud. So we build a bank from scratch, a retail bank from scratch, doing all the retail banking services, hundred percent in the cloud. In one year, we have less than hundred people, right? So we do not we can make profits and money and good margin without charging half of the, 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 the legacy banks charge because our infrastructure is very clean and, 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 and easy to scale. And I think in India, because the city was built from scratch entirely and, and, and started to be competitive, you know, the pressures went down yeah. uh, from the beginning, you know. Um, and I uh, don't like other people making money. They don't like you to make money. <laughs> Well, I, I, the, 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 that's what comes to regulator and, and what Eduardo said, you know, because I think we have two phases of regulation in Brazil. The first one was kind of um, on, from 94 and, and beyond, you know, the government needs to take control of the banks because it was a, it's a massive environment. You know, Same. the government's kind of funding banks. They don't know the balance sheet of the banks. So they have to consolidate to control and kind of have a, a clean visibility of the, 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 the systematic risk of the country. But as an output, we have concentration. Payments, we have uh, acquiring dual, uh, duopoly, 50% Visa, 50% MasterCard acquirings, right? And Banking, like, here. so, and then, of course, you put the price that you want, because if you have to receive with Visa, just this guy is allowed uh, to sell you, right? Uh, but the central bank is acting, uh, I think that we have the best central bank in the world, by far, right? Because... They look from an innovation perspective, competitive perspective, but also moving fast without broken the security of the system, which is really hard, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, and, and kind of balancing the pressures of the politics, yeah. Yeah. the legacy yeah. banks pressure and things like that, you know? I, I've been on this on the forums, you know, and, and I know how it is, but they're doing the job done. And, uh, and, uh, and who is winning? The consumer. It's making the life harder to everyone who wants to compete because they have to be better, cheaper, and, and provide great service. And you know what? Customers are becoming used with that. 
But you know, it's getting even more complicated. And especially if you think about crypto as becoming a fiat of exchange, and you think about just the new infrastructure being written on top of a distributed consent framework, like a, you know, whatever, yeah. whatever framework you can pick. The speed at which things are changing is becoming very difficult to keep part, you know, this. Yeah. So the instant reaction is ban it. Don't, you know, not allowed. <laughs> <laughs> Give me time so to example, breathe. Yeah. In, for example, in India, crypto is illegal. You're not allowed to. Right? Why, why do you think that that, that came? There's any, any... any new technology initially where you can't do KYC or trace will be used for quote unquote illegal things, right? Now that's no longer the case, but I'm saying that's how it, it starts. That's the first use case for any new technology. Even PayPal initially, when it started years ago, the yeah. biggest use case was pornography, you know? Yeah. Till they found eBay. So I think but, but for those in the audience, there's a great book. If you want to learn about the, the, the beginning, it's called PayPal Wars. Totally recommended. And it was pretty much about the, their, their fight against the, the dirty money inside the system, you know. Right. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, PayPal was actually not a payments company. It started out as a company for, for security for, for handheld devices. It was not a payments company. It became a wallet and found a use case and then grew from there. Which, and the number one use case was eBay, which is why eBay bought it initially, right? Yeah. So, but do you think, do you think, um, you know, this is something that I'm particularly very excited about because, as you mentioned, you know, the infrastructure nowadays is a, um, is a silos of, of information. You know, the banks are not real time between each other. Uh, they're, they, they're asynchronous uh, process and databases and very regional because they're tied to the regional infrastructure. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. I'm very excited about what happens when you have a global infrastructure that's 24 per seven, fully audited by design and move money at speed of light 24 per seven. Right. And, 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 uh, and doesn't cost you much. It's frictionless. So the other part of money transfer, money transfers today is expensive. It's not cheap. Right. So the minute that comes it, and that's the regulators issue, they don't want to lose control of currency. Right. They want to maintain control of fiat of exchange. And so in some ways, I think Everson, what will happen is you will have digital cryptocurrencies that are regulated, are issued by the government or backed by the government. And once that happens, then you can see this take off and the exchange becoming much, much, much more frictionless. It's already happening in some countries. Already happening, yes. Yeah. yeah. And it's a kind of, and it's funny though, because with China, China, E1, they put a competitive pressure that either do it or you don't have anything to compete. Right. Yes. And Thank the global market share of dollar can be like threatened by, 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 right. by those better experience, less friction and less costly. Yeah. So, so for anyone entrepreneurs looking to that problem, we're very excited about this thesis and we'd love to talk with you about it. Yes. Uh, 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 Actually, it's my belief that a lot of how we write software today and consume technology today will be rewritten in a distributed fashion. Not just currency, not just payments, a lot of different, because at the end of the day, you said it, any con anything that you start with is a transaction, right? And if you can create a transaction that's frictionless and you don't have a central control over it, I think you can create a lot more efficiency. So it's exciting, you know? Exactly. I, I think we do have many questions here. So I don't want to miss them. Uh, I think uh, uh, now, and, and actually, many many of them. I think it's pretty 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 much related with what we we've been discussing here. Uh, I'm gonna start with with the first one because uh, there, there's a the first one. I think has to do with uh, mono product and and universal kind of a, a more complete offering, right? We we do see many successful fintechs, you know, doing very well, you know, with only one product. Uh, uh, which is which is great because the service is is very good, but it's not very kind of a practical at the end of the day, right? Because uh, sure. you don't want to have you know relationships with 10, 15 different companies, right? Uh, so so I think that the question here is is if you if you guys think that uh, we're gonna see a wave of consolidation 
uh, of fintechs, right? We start to see that in, in some countries, right? Uh, US now you have Square buying, you know, like a buy now, pay later company. You have uh, PayPal naturally, they, they're, they're starting to do even like, more, more acquisitions, which is not so normal for them, but uh, they want to become like the super app. Uh, uh, in Brazil, we had a, uh, some, let's say, Stone trying to buy a stake in Inter, you know, we have a uh, uh, let's say new bank buying a stake in creditors, right? So, so trying to understand here, what, what do you think uh, it's, it's going to be the future, right? More consolidation of fintechs in the coming years for them to be able to offer a more complete, like uh, a solution? Uh, absolutely. I think at the end of the day, um, everybody wants to get the most efficient service, but also not go to too many different vendors, whether it's a person or a business, right? Essentially, even if, I don't know about you, but even if I use my credit card, I generally end up using the same card. Even if I have three, I only use that one again because I can track it better. I know what's, you know, then it's, it's easier. So consolidation has always been, I would say, you know, there's innovation and consolidation in every industry. There's waves of innovation, waves of consolidation. I think we're still very early actually in FinTech in many ways. So look at the volume of processing done online versus offline, we still are not at that place where you can say you have equilibrium. It's more offline even today, right? So long yes. way to go, I will also say that we are, we have a thesis here at March where we do invest in companies helping the incumbent banks create for new products and services because they already have a customer relationship. They know their customer, they know what the customer needs. So we, in, in, and Everson and I talked about this company Extend that we invested in. It's really about getting a existing old bank to compete with the new bank. Issue things like virtual cards and tracking, you know, your, your so, so you give your customers what they need, either you build it or you buy it. I mean, that's as simple as it is. That makes sense. So I, I have uh, like three takes on that. And um, the first, you know, what we saw at a kind of especially with the new companies they're pretty much like unbundling the bank especially in brazil we have a very special kind of universal bank approach where these guys are they're doing from wholesale bank to like a small medium business uh, finance consumer credit cards you know, they're doing everything and of course you cannot be good doing like 50 hundreds of products at the same time customer needs are very specific in different market how do you reach how do you serve, you know, and their needs. And I think that creates a, that's what's creating like this gigantic opportunity that we're seeing Latin America overall. Uh, but it started as an unbundled, very vertical product approach. Um, but over time with the customer relationship, understanding their needs, the bundling comes forward, right? And, and of course it makes a lot of sense because you're pretty much increasing your lifetime value in a to, to addressable market. And of course, your equity value as a consequence of that under the same customer base, pretty much building a few more lines of code, right? Or, or, or adding a little bit more services on that, so which I think is very, very, very smart. So, but that, that's one approach, right? And how you serve your, your customer in a, in a very uh, integrated way. But the question is, you can do that without having, the pro without having to own and operate the product. And that's the difference. We are very excited and 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 in partnering with some companies they are doing the infrastructure approach to pretty much transform everyone in a fintech without having to have banking license product whatever they're just doing the infrastructure you're taking your customer relationship your data you'll be able to offer lending and eventually getting access to a, a balance sheet as a service right and locking up that relationship putting more value added on their relationship uh, without having the burden to carry out the services or the infrastructure. So ultimately what you're seeing is that uh, everyone can be a bank, everyone can be a fintech, right? So if they have relationship data and distribution, you now have these companies who are enabling that. And ultimately what we, what, you know, bank used to be this big marble, you know, offices protecting everything. And now it's just becoming piece of code, you know, issuing is a, this piece of code, lending, this piece of code, QIC onboarding, this piece of code, and everyone can become that. So that's interesting because the level of competition increased the horizon. ERP can become a competitor of the bank, right? Uh, uh, a company who have a very uh, uh, good relationship with their value chain can become a competitor of the bank. You know? So 
So I think that that's play out uh, a very, very interesting way. So we have both theses here. One is like, how do we empower companies who are very well positioned inside good ecosystems and have a uh, trustworthy of their ecosystem, increasing this financial business in their, in their, in their uh, p &L without having to have heavily invest on that and just like turning that relationship into margin the next day in a frictionless, a frictionless, frictionless way and and providing better services so that's a big thesis you know uh, and there's a come from either investing in these companies or also investing in, in the providers of infrastructure to transform every company in the fintech but in the second way you know insurance you know huge opportunity the, we are having now the open insurance approach the same as we're having the open bank but the products have like still legacy experience friction a lot of friction bad risk pricing things like that that's a very vertical need how you put insurance for some specific as maddie say like on a sharing economy world on um, a small medium business or entrepreneurs you know you have to start vertical to solve an important problem then go beyond that so i i, I like that every single the other way of thinking about that is to say you have to be customer centric like what do your customers want and what yeah. can you give to them efficiently and easily you know we have a company called earn in which is really about people being able to access their wages before payday. But it's not a loan and there's no fee. There's no fee, no interest. So people love it. And the business model is tipping. People tip for getting money and four, four, five percent people tip. You know, it's, it's a very healthy business. But suddenly you realize you have 100 million people in the US. This is here in the US that are not banked well. They are, they are called the underbanked in some ways. You know, they are the kind of people, if you have an emergency, you can't find $200, $300. They don't have availability of that kind of money. So how do you build a suite of services to get them banking? Now you have customers. They have a few million customers that use their service every month. What else can you provide them? What are the products? You may build it. You may buy it. So, you know, that's just a business issue. Totally agree. Totally agree. What other questions do we have, Eduardo? That we oh, can sorry, answer. Sorry, yeah, I know I do. I do have actually. We uh, we do have some, a few here oh, okay. uh, asking about funding, right? I think funding. I think someone mentioned about that. You know, this is an issue. You know, in most of the countries, in India as well. I'd say having funding, funding. You know, uh, to some of the fintechs and new entrants. So it would be interesting to hear. I think Everson as well about Brazil, right? Uh, uh, Venture funding, you mean? Yeah, yeah, funding not not only equity funding. Uh, I, I, would, I would I would I would say equity funding for new for new technologies, right? Maybe disruptive technologies that eventually, let's say, I don't know, maybe crypto. Crypto now is becoming more more of a hot thing, you know. But uh, but uh, I think and also I say debt funding, right? Uh, we, we of course we do have these receivable funds, the Fiji keys. We do have the these financial supermarkets now, you know, kind of a BTD, BTG Digital XP, you know, which which I think uh, are more, let's say, developed, you know, capital markets in Brazil. But uh, how do you see funding in Brazil, you know, uh, playing out yeah, for yeah. for fintechs? Only a few have access, and maybe the other smaller ones don't have. How how do you see that? Well, I I, I come to the you know, Internet 1.0 in Brazil, when I was at Buscapé, we are, you put the whole Internet industry in a bar every Tuesday, it's, it's 30 people. We didn't have like angel investment, Series A fund, Series C fund, growth. I mean, that doesn't exist at all, right? Uh, and uh, so for me now, it's a kind of a paradise, you know, we, we have um, established an industry and finally we got uh, interest rates that, you know, reward the equity risk. And honestly, that's being like the asset class that being rewarded investors by far uh, the, the most right so uh we at the high brazil we are we are you know uh, compounding at around 50 percent plus irr in dollars right uh you cannot find that in the public markets or fixed income whatever because it's pretty much because these companies are providing great value to society and they'll be rewarded for that um, so I do not think, and and I'm not, I'm not seeing at least, that funding is an issue, independent of the size that you are. Either you are in like uh, pre-seed stage, you have a lot of funding in the market for, for angel, and, and we and we do have around generations of investors, you know, uh, that come from Internet 1.0 to now. They're being 
putting money back to, to, to the entrepreneurs as well. Series A funds, bunch of them, uh, and we do use it to have a, a, a gap in the growth funds. And that's something that me and Sumant, we talk a lot about in, uh, here in Brazil, because we used to have capital from angel to, to C to Series A and B, but C to IPO is a kind of a gap. And now it's being uh, totally solved. Now we are seeing the deals happening the global, by the global players, the, the, players the global players, players, right? So uh, the level of capital is deployed in Brazil uh, in the first nine months. It's uh, incredible, uh, 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 you know, almost a double of the last year. So uh, from uh, but of course, you know, uh, the level the level playing field is increasing. So uh, entrepreneurs have to be good. Business model that makes sense. Product has to have, uh, have some thickness, you know, uh, the basics, and it's becoming a global market. You know, look at the last hundred rounds, big rounds in Brazil. The vast majority of them, if it doesn't have uh, international investors, are either lead by international investors. You know, so uh, I think what is missing is, uh, you know, from from the markets like this global perspective. We are still seeing a lot of companies who are very regional focus and and for this industry at, at least my vision is like going forward this is going to be a global opportunity right so uh and 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 that's why you can reach this like 100 billion uh dollars company you, know, you have to think global because the problem is, is is brokeable on a global scale and we as a brazilians we have a competitive advantage because our markets is a kind of developing in terms of the pain points of the globe you know so we know how to deal with that um so that's one side from the debit side and and the credit side uh, uh i think that was kind of a, a, a more uh, uh, uh slow evolution but it's, it's getting very up to speed especially because of the uh, decreasing interest rates last year so a bunch of fedix now in the market we're seeing this what, it, what i'm called i come from e-commerce so the e-commerce of the finance so now you can e do e-commerce and buy fixed fixed income funds uh, you know, on these platforms like, you know, BTG, XP, and a bunch of others in the market, right? So consumers and retail have access to that. So it's phenomenal. Um, and, but the real evolution that I'm seeing, and actually Cloudwalk, one of, one of the portfolio companies are, are, are doing a great job on that. It's like, how do you massify the access to credit in a tokenized fashion, right? Using this, this new infrastructure, so you can have a, a, a piece of landing, let's say I land like a uh, hundred thousand dollars. I can broke this landing in like hundred pieces, right? Of $10,000 tokenize then and sell on the market in a direct relationship between, you know, investors and, and lenders and have all the data points being monitored online to the blockchain. And, you know, so that become a global access to capital for this type of opportunities they're paying yields that eventually not get in japan or in europe or even in us because they're negative interest rates so i think this will transform radically the the, the capital markets the access to credit because you're going to have a global infrastructure in a transparent fashion in a in a granular fashion that everyone can put money to work right and uh and uh and we're certainly batting around this vision as well uh but i do see that uh it's changing very rapidly. You're not going to be locked up in the hands of the the, the small distributors up and credit appetites in the market. So the balance sheet, uh, it's becoming as a service as well, and that's great. No, great. I think I have a question here. I think it's more for uh, Suman to, uh, think, because I think he mentioned that, uh, and I tend to agree as well that in, in many of these these things, you know, US seems to be lagging a bit. So. Uh, I think the question here is what are the lessons, you know, U.S. regulators and entrepreneurs can learn from other markets that have gone, you know, uh, there before, you know, what, what, what learnings can apply to the U.S., uh, which learnings do, do not transfer over the U.S., you know, so. Right, I mean, the basic fact is the U.S. as a market is, is, a lo is an older financial services ecosystem than a lot of the rest of the world other than maybe Western Europe, right? There is a lot of institutional stuff that happened here in the last three, four decades post-World War II that the other part of the world just never had. So you have to deal with legacy. It's the same with telecom services in some ways or wired to wireless and the adoption of wireless in this country versus something, something like in Brazil or in India. You have no choice. You have to go to the next generation, right? So it's partly driven by that. Partly the US regulator is lagging. There's no question. In some ways it's lagging more because it is probably more political here. I think, I think that the, 
the difference between financial regulation on a national level versus state level versus local level, uh, the banking systems, banking regulations, you know, so it's hard to say you can transfer exactly what's happened somewhere else here. Now, you mentioned buy now, pay later. That as a service has just taken off, right? And it's European companies that showed us the way, not the US companies. And now the US companies are getting involved in it and they're catching up to it. Um, neo banks. I think the US actually has a pretty fair advantage and in, in, in a healthy ecosystem of new banks that are coming up and, and are serving different niches in the market. Sustainable, long term, I don't know. But look at Stripe as a payments company. It's probably the most valuable company in the world in payments today, right? Privately. Um, it's not the same as MasterCard, Visa, PayPal. Those are much more valuable. But you know, you have companies like ID Income from Europe and showed the way what needs to happen here, and then the incumbents catch up. Um, you know, it's. I think access to capital has always been a challenge in different parts of the world. The U.S. actually is a more, I would say, easier place to access ta uh, capital than other parts of the world. So that also leads to more innovation, right? But that's sort of my take on it. I see Ravi and Matty are back, so they're probably telling us we're done. Yeah. So I just want to finish, and I want I want to do a, a kind of a uh, wrap up with with Eduardo on the. You know, it's funny though, we are seeing in the media the kind of the, the last uh, round on the race before the checkered flag, you know, companies who are going to IPO, et cetera. And, and you mentioned Stripe, they are, I, I don't know the last valuation, but like, uh, it's a, uh, it's a I think pretty valuable. Million, right? 95 billion. 95, 100 billion. 95 billion dollars to private. Yeah. New bank yeah. is IPO between 40 and 50 billion dollars. Uh, so the level of value create Microsoft went public, I think around five hundred million dollars as a, a, a in the IPO. Oh, so the value that million. yeah, <laughs> yeah. So the value that's being created on the private markets, uh, are, it's phenomenal and huge. And I think we're going to see there's a dozens of billions of dollars in Latin America that the world's not seeing. That's going to pop up over the next two three years, and that's going to drive a new generation of capital uh, to supply the next generation of companies. So just to finish the deal before Javi ends. What are you seeing from the pipeline IPOs and, and you know, what are your takes on that since you're covering and, and, and you, you did and work in the fintech IPOs and NASDAQ, like XP, Pax, Seguro, uh, Stone, and now you're seeing a new generation of companies coming on, you know, to, just to oh, finish. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we had recently Deal Local come into the market as well, or an Uruguayan fintech, which is worth roughly $15 billion. I think uh, eBanks uh, should come probably at the start of next year. You know, it's also a very successful company. You know, they both, they are kind of, they have business models somehow similar to Adyen, right? Uh, very profitable and high growth companies. You have like Nubank now listing in the US. Uh, uh, you have Elo, the, 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 who competes in Brazil with Visa and MasterCard, you know, willing to list in US, right? So I think uh, we're going to have uh, many, lots of, of, of new companies, special comp Brazilian companies going to, to US, right? So I'm excited. Fantastic. Thank you guys so much for an incredible conversation, Simon, Eduardo, and Everson. And thank you to all of our attendees for joining us today. Ravi, I'll let you close it out. Well, thank you, Eduardo, uh, Everson, and Simon. There are lots of questions that didn't get answered. So we should do this again, perhaps sometime in Q1 of next year. Thank you all for joining today. Absolutely. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Eduardo. Bye, Simon. Bye.